Hi, we're going to talk about magnetos and ignition systems today. Magnetos are a very old-fashioned technology. Uh, you can find a magneto pretty much identical to one of the ones on your aircraft. Uh, if you look at an old 1920s vintage Ford tractor, they've been around a long time uh, and they have a couple of advantages. One is that they're very dependable. They're very simple. Um, uh, to make them even more dependable, we use two of them uh, on the aircraft. So if one fails, the other one's still going. Each of the two provides sparks to all four or all six of the cylinders um, as appropriate. So that if one fails, the other one will still run the whole engine. They are completely independent of the electrical system. In fact, there are many older aircraft that didn't have electrical systems, and the magnetos still worked fine. Uh, so it doesn't matter if your alternator fails and your battery goes dead, your engine's going to keep on running. They're also pretty efficient once they get going and are spun up. They create a good, good hot spark. And having two of them allows us to light the fuel air mixture off in two places instead of one, and that also makes it more efficient. That's why when you're doing your magneto check, you, you get a little bit of a drop when you switch from both magnetos to one magneto, because with one magneto, it's not burning as well. This shows how the magnet inside the magneto, which, by the way, is how it gets its name, as magneto is, comes from magnet, this four-pole magnet uh, spins inside the magneto. This four-pole magnet spins inside of the magneto exactly in proportion to the engine speed. It's all geared directly to the engine. When the poles are lined up with the pole shoes, mag the magnetic flux from the magnet is transferred into the coil core. When the poles disalign with the pole shoes, the, um, ma the coil core doesn't have any flux flowing through it. It's this change in flux that we take advantage of. Not so much the strength of the flux, but the change of strength of the flux is what we're after. Uh, uh, by the way, there's a typo in your text. This is, shouldn't say fuel register. It should say full register. And so what neutral and full register mean in this case is neutral is where the uh, a magnet is not aligned with the pole shoes and full register is when they're perfectly aligned. And so you can see the uh, the red curve here represents the strength of the magnetic field in the coil. And the point at which it's changing the fastest is what we're really after. And we can take advantage of that by wrapping a wire around the coil core. And now as the magnetic flux builds and collapses, it induces a small voltage in the primary coil. The primary coil runs through a set of breaker points. They're just a switch that's opened and shut by a little cam that's spinning inside the magneto at the same speed as everything else. Um, there's a condenser that you'll see in a lot of these diagrams in parallel with the points. All it does is keep the points from burning up because they spark. Um, so it makes this, it deadens the spark on the uh, breaker points. That's all that does. So you can kind of set that aside for now. Here's a more complex drawing of it. And you can see the magnet uh, down below and the coil core. And we've wrapped um, uh, about a couple hundred turns of thick wire around this coil core. So as the magnet turns and the flux builds and collapses, it causes a current to flow in the primary circuit. Right when that primary circuit current is at its strongest, the cam opens up the breaker points and turns it off. And we take advantage of that uh, by wrapping a second coil around the first coil. And we call that the secondary coil. Uh, so the as the flux lines collapse in the primary coil, as the current is turned off there, they collapse through the secondary coil. And that and the secondary coil has a lot more windings on it. I'm not sure how many, but it's probably on the order of a thousand windings of a smaller gauge wire. And that 
amplifies the voltage uh, from the primary voltage to the secondary voltage so that we get upwards of 20,000 volts in that secondary coil and that's enough to make a nice hot spark for us. Now that spark happens uh, really fast. We, we make a whole bunch of sparks in a, exactly in proportion to the engine speed but each time the magneto produces a spark it has to send it to a different cylinder and so we have what we call a distributor which is a rotating switch uh, and it rotates at a speed whereby the the tip of the switch aligns with a different spark plug wire each time the the magneto fires so that it sends a spark to the appropriate cylinder um, each time it fires. Now we need a way to turn this whole thing off and we do that by grounding the primary circuit. What that does is, remember we, get, we got our spark by collapsing the current in the primary circuit when we open the points. Well if we ground out the primary circuit altogether then the points opening and shutting doesn't matter anymore. Um, and we never get that spark producing collapse of the uh, primary circuit. So this ground here is called the P lead. And uh, uh, if the P lead is connected to ground, then the magneto is off. If you disconnect it or turn the key to an on position, uh, then the primary circuit is no longer grounded on that, on, with that wire and the magneto is hot. You could also just unplug the primary lead from the magneto and the magneto is hot, which is why they are a little bit dangerous because uh, you, can, uh, you can just have a broken wire and it makes it actually work instead of having a broken wire that makes something not work is what we're used to thinking about. Um, these work by default, or another way of saying that is they are fail-safe. They work. Here's a more detailed diagram of the Magneto. We have the drive over here at the impulse coupling. We'll talk more about impulse couplings here in a minute. Uh, but, but that goes, the impulse coupling engages a slot on the inside of the engine that is turning. So it, this whole thing gets turned in proportion to engine speed. So the impulse coupler drives the magnets um, the, the, and that creates the spark. Um, we also have a set of gears that run the cam for opening up the breaker points which are down inside here. And we have that driving a, a distributor uh, in order to distribute the spark to the various uh, cylinders. I recommend that you follow the link in D2L uh, to the virtual magneto and kind of go through the steps of assembling each of those parts. That'll kind of give you a good idea of, about how these things are put together. So, so far uh, we have the primary coil where current is induced by the change in magnetic flux of the, because of that spinning magnet. We have the secondary coil where current is induced uh, when the primary flux lines collapse because we open the points. We have a distributor that distributes each spark to the appropriate cylinder uh, at just the right time uh, in its uh, uh, compression stroke, right late in the compression stroke. We also have a condenser that keeps the points from eroding and we have a P lead which we hook to ground to turn the magneto off. There are two types of timing on magnetos. One is internal timing where we have to adjust the points that they, so that they open um, at just the right time so that we take advantage of that, uh, that primary current collapsing and get the most spark out of it. That's an A and P thing. They do that in the shop. Uh, and then the magneto has to be timed to the engine so that the spark occurs at the correct point in the four-stroke cycle. This is once again a mechanic thing. Um, they have a special little piece of equipment they use the, and they uh, actually turn the magneto as it's mounted on the engine. They can very carefully uh, adjust the angle that the magneto is mounted on the back of the engine in order to determine where the spark is going to occur in the four-stroke cycle. It really needs to happen right about here. During the compression stroke, uh, 
just before it gets to top dead center, um, typically around 22 to 25 degrees before top dead center, maybe as much as 28 degrees. Now, for starting, um, we have a couple of things that we need to change in the way that we produce our spark. First of all, magnetos produce a pretty weak spark at a very low RPM. They really don't start coming on until about 400 RPM. Um, second, we normally, as we just discussed, fire the magneto before top dead center. And if we do this while the engine is turning very slow, like, like it is when we're trying to start it, it might cause the engine to suddenly reverse direction because we're, we're, we're trying to compress that fuel-air mixture. If we light it off, it might just push it back the other way. We call that kickback. Um, and so we need a system that both produces a hotter spark and delays the spark until top dead center. The simplest way to do that is the impulse coupler, uh, which all our 152s have and many of the 172s have. Uh, and it's a wind-up device that's mounted between the engine and the magneto. And at very low RPM, a set of centrifugal dogs engage a stop pin, and it stops the magneto from turning while the engine continues to turn. Uh, when it gets wound up to the point where the cylinder is at top dead center, um, it contacts uh, the body, and of the uh, impulse coupler and releases the spring and the magneto catches up really fast. And so it accomplishes both things that we need. It delayed the spark to top dead center and because the magneto turns really fast as the spring catches it up, we get a hotter spark. So it does both. Really simple. It doesn't require battery power to do it. Really cool little system. The only real drawback to these is that they will trip even if you're turning the propeller very 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 slowly um, when you get to top dead center they will trip and so if you turn the propeller in the normal direction that it turns um, and listen you'll hear a click or if the magnetos are not perfectly timed together it'll be a click click if you're turning really slow that will cause a nice hot spark and cause the engine to fire. And that's, that's why we spend so much time cautioning people about turning the propeller. If you turn the propeller backwards, then the impulse couplers don't engage, and that makes it a little bit less da dangerous. So the impulse coupler um, engages at very low RPM. A set of dogs engage and winds up a spring. And at about top dead center, it releases and we get a nice hot spark. Um, these may be installed on one or both mags. Most of the Cessnas in our fleet, I believe, have it on both magnetos. Some older aircraft only put it on one magneto. If that's the case, tradition calls for them to mount it on the left magneto. So remember, left magneto for starting. A vibrating starting system is another way to do it. We have this on the Robinson helicopters and some of the newer model uh, 172s. Its uh, brand name is Shower of Sparks System. And it's used on bigger airplanes, uh, bigger engines and airplanes uh, uh, to, uh, as well as some of the smaller ones. Uh, and it uses a vibrator circuit to supply uh, the primary of one of the magnetos with a pulsing DC circuit. So um, we, we, it's, you can think of it as supplying an alternate source of primary current because the mag magnet is not spinning fast enough yet. They include a separate set of retarded points, and that's not a judgment thing. It's, by retarded, we mean that the points are going to open a little bit later uh, in the uh, four-stroke cycle than the regular points, uh, but they're a separate set of points. The way the vibrator works is um, you can think of the electricity coming in here from the battery. Uh, it goes through um, this set of points here and off to the primary coil of the magneto. Um, this spring here is holding the points closed right now in the vibrator. But as soon as the power comes into this system, it also goes down through this coil, which forms an electromagnet. And the electromagnet pulls those points open. Well, now the electromagnet is turned off, and so the spring closes the points again. Oop, 
uh, but now the magnet is back or the magnet is back on so it opens them closes them opens them closes them except really really fast and so you'll hear it um, uh, as a buzz uh, probably about a uh, 50 or 60 cycle per second buzz it, it goes really really fast and the result is we have pulsing uh, DC coming out and going to the primary circuit of the of one of the magnetos and once again since we're using uh, one of the magnetos for the starting uh, we use typically the left magneto on this one here's what the circuit looks like I used a different one than your book your book um, provides a, a circuit that is probably more accurate than this but kind of confusing to look at and and so let's walk through this real quick here um, we have an ignition switch um, that is housed within this dashed rectangle here. Um, so when you're turning the key, or you're actually uh, opening and closing a set of five switches if you have this type of system. Two of the switches are connected to our uh, P leads um, to turn the magnetos off. So in the off position, uh, we have grounded both the left and the right magneto. When we move to the start position, a number of things happen. First of all, note that the right magneto is still turned off. Okay, We don't have a starting system on that, so we're just going to leave that off during the start. Um, however, we did uh, close the starter relay switch, and that energizes the starter, and the starter motor starts turning the engine. So that's where that big red uh, wire is going up at the top here, is where we're running the starter motor to turn the engine. It also supplies current to the induction vibrator, uh, and the induction vibrator starts sending out pulsed DC down this wire through this, these two switches, which are closed. Um, and that goes into the uh, points in the uh, left magneto. And this is, a, again, a separate set of retarded points that are the opening right at top dead center. And when those are points are open, it provides that pulsed DC through this wire into the primary circuit, and that provides a pulse of sparks, a, a series of sparks, out to the appropriate spark plug through the distributor out to the appropriate spark plug. So you don't get just one spark um, in each cylinder. You get a whole series of them, and that's why they call it a shower of spark system. And then when you release the key, all those switches open. Now neither of the magnetos is grounded, and which means that they are both on, and the, uh, the normal points are what control now the left magneto as well as the right magneto, and the aircraft just runs normally from there. So that's magnetos. Um, now in this day and age, we're starting to see some electronic ignition systems in uh, general aviation aircraft as well. We've had these on uh, cars since the 70s, and they're getting more and more uh, advanced. Um, these have uh, some advantages and some disadvantage. Uh, the big disadvantage is that it does use battery power. So instead of using a spinning magnet to get our electricity, we use power from a battery. Uh, in order to, now obviously the downside of that is if your electrical system fails and you lose your battery power, then your engine's going to quit. So, so some systems, um, or some installations, I should say, uh, they only do it on one of the two magnetos, and the other one, they just leave a regular magneto, so if the battery dies, you've still got one ignition system still going. Uh, other systems rely on a battery backup, so if your electrical system fails, there's a separate battery that will supply power to the ignition system long enough for you to get to a nearby airport but you are going to be in for a diversion if that happens. So that's the big difference is they, they, they just use battery power instead of a rotating magnet. That's the big difference on electronic ignition systems. There's other sim there's lots of things that are very similar. They still use a set of points to, uh, to and, a, and a set of coils to amplify the voltage. They still need distributors to direct the voltage to the correct cylinder. Um, they still use the same kind of spark plugs, although they may be gapped slightly different. But they are, they can be made more efficient because rather than having a fixed uh, point at which they fire each compression stroke, um, they, it can adjust that advance 
on demand. So if the engine is under a heavier load, they can retard the, the spark slightly, or if you're not under heavy load, they can advance it more and get more fuel efficiency, um, and it can provide a start a late hot spark on starting. Uh, so there are some things we can do with it. it. What it results in is increased fuel efficiency, and it's pretty significant. Uh, it'll take a an engine that burns typically six or seven gallons an hour and take it all the way down below five. So it's it is significant. There are many different systems out there, um, and so it doesn't really do us much good to go over any one specific system here uh, because you're going to need to learn whatever system is in the aircraft to crawl into. Uh, as you do that, uh, just remember the five things that every pilot needs to know about every system. What is it? How does it work? So you already know what it is. I just told you that. That's really all you need to know. How does it work? How does it fail? So what are its failure modes? How do I know it's failed and what do I do next? And, and that's going to vary a little bit from one electronic ignition to another. Now whether you have electronic ignition or magneto ignition, you end up having to put the spark through a spark plug. And all a spark plug does is provide an air gap for electricity to jump over. Um, to, uh, what we need to do is have a, a gap that is wide enough that about 20,000 volts will jump over it. Typically though, the wider the gap, the higher the voltage. The, the more the voltage will go up before it jumps that gap. Um, so you'll get a hotter spark. But if you go too far uh, and, and get too wide of a gap, then the, the spark becomes unreliable. It doesn't fire every time. Uh, and so there's a very specific gap that the spark plug has to be gapped to in order for it to work reliably. And, and that, once again, gets checked by our, our, uh, our mechanic. Although you as pilots are um, licensed to install spark plugs and and so if you're going to do that it pays to know how to check that gap before you put them on. Here are some figures out of your book uh, about spark plugs. Uh, the This little tray here is real common. Uh, most mechanics have one of these in their toolbox and it's a way of keeping the spark plugs organized so that you know which cylinders they came out of and, and we use them for diagnosing. Um, there are a bunch of ways spark plugs can fail, and most of you have probably had this happen to you already, although you may not have understood exactly what was going on. Um, the carbon uh, that is produced when you burn a hydrocarbon fuel like gasoline can build up inside the engine and on the spark plug, and that carbon conducts electricity. So if it builds up too much, rather than having an air gap for the spark to jump over, you just have carbon for it to flow through, and, and then it doesn't produce a spark. The same thing is true with lead. Um, if we have a, the, the lead will actually condense and build up inside, uh, and that will short out the spark plug so that it, uh, rather than having an air gap, again, it just flows through the lead. The uh, electrodes can actually erode. You can see here how uh, the metal has, has been torn away by the electrons. That hot spark burned that metal away. And sometimes the, the gap can be too wide. Here are some pictures that I took of a real spark plug. Um, uh, this one here is, is a fairly new healthy spark plug and you can see the center electrode is nice and round. This type of spark plug by the way is called a massive electrode spark plug. The previous pictures were fine wire spark plugs. Those are more expensive. These are massive electrode and they're the cheapest ones. You'll pay around 15 or 20 bucks a copy for these um, if you buy just a few. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, the, the center electrode is nice and round here and unworn. We've got a good clean gap. The inside of it is clean. It's been run. You can tell that it's already um, got a little bit of, of uh, surface rust around the inside, which is normal, but that's a good healthy spark plug. This one um, has been subject to some, perhaps some oil um, uh, in the the rings may be leaking some oil into the cylinder. Um, there's some carbon buildup there. And note that the center electrode is sort of football shaped, um, which means that the sides of the electrode have been worn away a little bit. So this one's this one's getting down there. And you can see also some little, little nodules here. Those could be carbon, could be lead. Here's a spark plug um, that is really leaded up bad. Um, and you can see how the lead actually filled up 
the uh, the spark plug down around the ceramic insulator inside there, as well as built up around the electrodes. And uh, and when lead builds up like that way, the the electricity will just flow through the lead rather than jumping the gap, and then you you'll it won't fire. You'll experience this as a pilot as a rough running engine when you do your magneto check. So when you switch from both to one, whichever magneto uh, is is connected to one of these fouled up plugs will run a little bit rough. Um, sometimes, uh, if it's just a little bit fouled, you can bring the RPM up, maybe lean it a little bit, get the inside of that uh, combustion chamber hot, uh, and it'll melt off the carbon deposit or the the lead deposit and then when you recheck the magneto you'll be good to go uh, and that's acceptable if you if you can clear it up like that uh, then you get to go flying uh, don't push it though um, it is possible to overheat these engines on the ground especially when they're misfiring um, uh, various you know pre-ignition and detonation can happen when plugs are are fouled like this so um, so don't sit there for 10 minutes trying to free up the spark plug. Um, if, if you can't get it done in, in one or two attempts, you need to taxi back and have a mechanic come out and pull the plugs and, and replace them. It doesn't take very long. You've probably lost your slot if you're trying to get a lesson done, uh, but it's not too big of a deal to, to, to pull these out. They can be cleaned with a little uh, bead blaster machine. Uh, that's kind of a mechanic thing, though. I think it is allowed under uh, preventive maintenance, but I, I recommend that you l leave that to an A&P mechanic. It's super critical that you get every last little piece of bead blasting material out of there, because if one of those comes loose inside the combustion chamber, um, it's going to really wreak havoc. Uh, um, so that we'll leave that to the professionals. So that's it on ignition systems uh, this time around. Uh, they, they are really technically kind of an electrical system, so if you haven't had airframe uh, systems yet, uh, some of this might have been a little bit confusing to, um, to you. Stick to the basics, though. What is it and how does it work? Um, you don't have to get down into the electronics of it, usually. Uh, but how does it fail? Um, how do I know it's failed and what do I do next? Those are the important questions as with any system. We'll see you next time.